Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly respected stage manager and production supervisor for Broadway shows and touring productions throughout the world. He's worked on many shows, including Wicked, Cabaret, Phantom of the Opera, Annie Get Your Gun, Gypsy, West Side Story, and many more. For many years, he's been the international production supervisor for Jersey Boys. He travels on the road with Patti Lapone and Mandy Patinkin on their concert tours. And for over 20 years, he's been one of the lead producers of the Broadway Barks Animal Shelter Adoption Event with Bernadette Peters that's held every summer in New York City. When the pandemic hit in March 2020, the entire entertainment industry abruptly and indefinitely came to a crashing halt. Our guest decided to start writing a blog on social media, which over time was read and enjoyed by thousands of people. His thought-provoking and insightful essays were not just about COVID. He wrote about everything, from his love of New York City and the world of theater, to the Black Lives Matter movement and the chaotic, profoundly troubling events in American politics, leading up to and following the presidential election. His daily columns have been compiled into a brand new book entitled, Hold Please, Stage Managing a Pandemic. And those essays written from March 12th, 2020 to June 10th, 2021, collectively continue to give us insights, food for thought and guidance in multiple ways. I'm delighted to welcome Richard Hester to our show. Richard, thank you so much for being here. Harvey, thank you so much for having me. Richard, I want to start by asking you, what exactly does a stage manager do? Our job is really to be the director when the director has put the show up and left the show. So that the best description I think that I could give is that for anybody who's ever watched Downton Abbey, I'm Mr. Carson, the guy who runs downstairs. I'm in charge of absolutely everything, but it's not my house. It's somebody else's house. You wrote that if an actor walks off the stage during a tech rehearsal and a huff about something, it's your job to get them back on that stage. So how do you do that? You really have to kind of dig deep and just try anything. In the middle of a tech, there's a lot of money at stake. There's a lot of people sitting there. And if someone storms off the set for whatever reason, you have to go back and you can't add energy to the situation. So you have to keep calm. You have to find out why they stormed off. You have to, in that instant, try and figure out a way to solve whatever it is that is upsetting them and get them back on stage. You can't lie either because you can't say, absolutely, that's what we'll do if that's not what the producers are going to agree to do. So there's a lot of I'll see what I can do. I hear what you're saying. Let's get back to work and we'll figure this out later. I think with those kind of diplomatic skills, you could actually be an ambassador and bring peace to the Middle East. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, spending eight months with Elaine Stritch on a delicate balance, I would have to agree with you. <laughs> well, you described her as one of the most challenging people you ever worked with because she thrived by creating chaos and mayhem off stage. What did you mean by that? She was a well-known alcoholic and she had become a diabetic and she had stopped drinking. And I honestly believe that she was terrified. I think she had terrible stage fright. And I think that the drinking got her on stage. And without the drinking, she needed something to get out there. And so what she did is she created chaos backstage. She had fits about things that really weren't things that anybody should have fits about. And she got once she got everybody backstage worked up into a frenzy, she then could go out and do the work with that energy behind her. Uh, and it took me a long time to realize that she needed to do that and she didn't necessarily need me to fix whatever was wrong. She needed me to actually kind of freak out a little bit so that she could take that energy. But she, she I will say that, I mean, it was very challenging working with her, but I ultimately did 
come to very much enjoy her on other levels. So you're not just a diplomat, you're actually a psychologist too. And maybe a little bit of a sadist. <laughs> <laughs> now, Richard, as we all know, the pandemic was anxiety provoking and scary, and it was the most monumental societal change we've ever lived through. Tell me what life was like for you and your husband before the pandemic. Well, I had been working on Jersey Boys as the international supervisor, which meant that I was going all over the world, setting up companies, going back and checking on them. I would, we were doing casting sessions all over the place. In fact, the week before the pandemic, I was in London. We were doing an open call for cast members for the Norwegian Cruise Line version. And I was, I would say I was away from home about 150 to 175 days a year, every year. It was nonstop. And when I was back in New York, I was working, I was casting, I was seeing the New York show. I was never not moving. And Michael, as an actor, was the same. He has a recurring role on Law and Order as a judge. And he, between those, he was scrambling to get more work. And he was sometimes working on shows, sometimes not working on shows. So we just passed each other, you know, in the morning. We'd sort of wake up and go, oh, hey, how are you? What are you doing today? And then give a long list. And then we'd say, okay, well, see you later tonight if we happen to be home. And that was it. So the pandemic started and suddenly it was the exact opposite. We had been together at that point for oh, nearly 15 years, I think. And we had never spent that much time together in one space. So it was a complete adjustment. Now you and your husband actually got COVID early on and then you got it again this past June, correct? Yes, yes. And I, I'll, I'll say that the this past June, Getting COVID at the beginning gave us this sort of false sense of security, I think. I think we felt that we had it so that we were going to be fine. And we still weren't seeing anybody, so we were, you know, protected in that regard. But we never really had that fear, which turns out, in retrospect, we should have. But it, it actually made our lives easier knowing that we'd had it and relatively mild cases of it, and we were fine. When I got it again this past June, I, it was actually worse than I had it the first time. What made you decide to start writing your columns on social media? The f literally the first day that everything shut down, I was on Facebook and I was looking at all my friends and what they were posting. And everybody was losing their minds. They were posting things that weren't true. They were ignoring things that were true. And there was a one sort of hysterical post was leading to six more hysterical posts, which was then leading to 25 more hysterical posts. So I, it was literally, uh, I kind of, my instinct that the same thing that would happen in a tech when a actor sort of started losing their mind and stormed off stage, just sort of took over and I sat down and, and wrote that day. And I said, okay, this is what's happening. This is real, but common sense dictates that this probably isn't real. So don't worry about that. We're going to be fine. It's all good. And I got a lot of positive response from it and more stuff happened that night. And I wrote again the next day and I just started writing every day. And Rick Ellis, who did the foreword of the book, who was one of the authors of Jersey Boys, we, we ran in, into each other on the street, maybe about a hundred days in. And he said to me, when did you realize you were gonna have to do this every day? And think, oh Lord. And I said, about post 30. <laughs> and I, it got to the point where if I didn't post soon enough, I started getting texts from people saying, where is it, where is it? And honestly, it's not anything I set out to do. It just happened. And no one truly was more surprised about it than I was. Well, what inspired you to collect all your essays and compile them into a book? Well, as it was going on, all sorts of people started reading them. And one of the people who read them was Rick Sordelay, who is a one of the premier Broadway fight choreographers. He and his son, Christian, 
have Corey, I work with him on Titanic, the musical, which is how I knew it. Rick Sordelay had has a publishing company that he formed with an author, a friend of his named David Blixt. And David Blixt had been with a publisher and then that, and published a few books with them and they weren't going to continue with him. So Rick and David got together, formed Sordelay Inc. to keep David in print. And as they got successful at that, they started expanding and working with first time writers to publish their, their books. And Rick was one of the people who was reading my posts. And Rick and I had a conversation at one point and Rick said, this is a book. Uh, and I was maybe, it was about the same time I ran into Rick thing. I was about a hundred posts in. And I thought, okay, I don't know if I have a, a whole book's worth of stuff to say, but great, let's, let's do that. And interestingly, just in terms of writing, just as I thought, on each given topic that I would not have something to say, something else happened. And if you look at that year, it's perfectly divided into chapters. The first three months were COVID. And just as everyone was getting used to COVID, George Floyd was murdered. The next three months, we were all reacting to George Floyd. We were all trying to examine what that meant for us as a society, as that, sort of became absorbed by all of us, the election started. And that went, and that culminated in three months. And then of course there was the aftermath of the election which took the next three months. So it lent it, it just as I thought, oh, I don't have anything more to say about the whatever, something new would happen. And then suddenly there was a whole new raft of stuff to talk about. Your father wrote for a living and your mom was a librarian. Do you think it was inevitable that one day you would write a book? I don't know if it was inevitable, but it was always one of those things that was on my bucket list of things to do. When Rick had reached out and we, and we knew we were going to publish it, my goal was to just hold it in my hand. I, I sort of almost didn't care about what happened to it after. And now I'm finding that the aftermath of it is really interesting and, and as fascinating as the putting it together. How do you, how does anybody know that there's a book out there? How does that work? And my mother has been one of my strongest supporters and my father, while he was alive, was as well, I have to say. They were they're both really supportive. I think my father would have been thrilled with this book. I, I mean, just the fact of its existence. I think he, he would have been very excited about it. Oh, there's no question about that. Now, your book is a product of social media because it's a compilation of your social media posts. But a lot of social media during the pandemic was full of lies, conspiracy theories, and just plain garbage. Richard, what do you think of social media? I think that it, it is the best of worlds and the worst of worlds wrapped up into one thing. It is the thing that is connecting all of us and certainly connected us during the pandemic. Uh, the, the groups of people, the, we were just up in the Berkshires this past week, visiting a whole group of people that we had Zoomed with once a week, half of whom I had never seen in person before, or they me. And so we, we, we've created some very solid friendships through sort of being social online. The, I've gotten, as a result of my posts in the books, I've become friends with a whole slew of people that I never would have met otherwise, who are all friends of friends, and some of them complete strangers, who I actually have online relationships with. I have no idea if we would get along at all in person, but certainly online, it, it's very interesting. All of that, kind of contrasts with all of the nonsense that's out there. And I think that it is only making some of the ingrained prejudices worse. So uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard bargain. It, it's, it's, got, it's definitely got its advantages and it definitely has its disadvantages as well. Well, one of the advantages for me is that I got to have you on our show. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> that you turned to social media. Now, you wrote about a phenomenon called collective effervescence, 
which happens when a group or a society experiences a common event together and shares the same emotions like we do in the theater. How do you feel collective effervescence applied during the pandemic in New York City? Emile Durkheim came up with the idea of collective effervescence. And it's something that I remembered from my college studies in philosophy, and I have never forgotten it. And it's that sense that, you know, if you're, if you're shoulder to shoulder with audience and you're seeing a comedy, your laughing infects the people around you and the people around you's laughing infects you. If you're spread out, that happens less and less. So how do you socially effervesce if you're completely separate from everyone? And ultimately, I think it's not possible. I think Zooming and everything was as close as we could get, but we were starved for human contact by the time we got to the place where things were starting to loosen up. Michael and I had one group of friends that we would meet in Central Park and we'd all bring our beach chairs even in the middle of snow. And we'd set up giant circles and bring food that was all wrapped individually. And we'd all sort of get tested. And then we'd sort of put the food in the middle of this giant circle. And then everyone, we would sort of have these weird picnics. And even that helped. It, it was just, there was an actual person there as opposed to a, an image on the screen. Yeah, it was a very lonely time. There are several themes that run through your columns, Richard, besides your obvious and well-justified disgust for the former president. One of those themes was the need for governments to find the right balance between protecting people's health versus protecting the health of the economy and also respecting people's right to refuse to be vaccinated. Looking back, were there things that you believe the governments could have done differently to manage the pandemic? It's, that's always a question that you really, regrets are very difficult to deal with because they, they're not helpful ultimately. Andrew Cuomo should have not done what he did with the nursing home situation. They made nursing homes medical facilities and therefore once people had COVID, they were moving people into the nursing homes and the nursing homes were then it was spreading like wildfire in the nursing homes, as we know, and many people died. He knew fairly soon that this was a bad choice, but he had made it and he kind of dug his heels in it, from what I gather. So he should not have done that. But when the choice was being made was in crisis. So I don't know what he was, I don't know what his options were. Uh, I don't know if there was, if he thought he was doing the right thing or whether he thought he was doing the easy thing. And at the moment I am, what I'm working on now is I'm, I'm writing uh, about my father and hi the history of his side of the family. And there's a lot of, uh, my great, great, great grandfather owned, uh, ins had enslaved people working for him. And you, I'm trying to look at all of the history through the lens of what was happening in that moment, as opposed to what we learned afterwards. And things certainly could have been done better. You know, when our ex-president put the travel bans in place, an actual travel ban might have helped, but no such thing ever occurred. He banned people coming in from China, but he allowed Americans who were in China to come back. Well, that's not a ban. That's, if you were seriously going to ban, you would lock the door, but the door was never locked. There were always people that he liked allowed in, but the virus didn't care who he liked and who didn't. The virus hopped onto everybody. I am almost 100% convinced that I brought it back myself from London when I, when I came. So I, I, don't, I don't know if, if th there are plenty of things in hindsight that the government could have done better. But in the moment, I don't know that there is anything, I don't know, you, I don't know if you can judge in the moment 
what is what is going to happen. I think it's very difficult to tell. Well, now, as you know, we filmed this show in Toronto, and I'm going to ask you a distinctly Canadian question, Richard. Throughout your book, you lamented the fact that unlike the populations of most other countries, a large number of Americans, including politicians, refused to take the advice of the medical experts and scientists on how to stop the spread of COVID. What is it about Americans, do you think, that allows them to elect someone like Trump and to ignore science and common sense when it came to the pandemic? I wish I knew. I truly wish I knew. The, you know, there were all these, the, everyone was basically so, sort of saying, sorry, Canada, we're kind of a burning meth lab down here, but we'll, we'll try and get it together. I am, I'm still, I'm, you know, when Richard Nixon resigned, 25% of the country was still solidly behind him. There are still people who think Richard Nixon was not a criminal at all. You know, I've been watching the January 6th hearings and they are truly fascinating and amazing. And we're look, I can look at it and say, wow, is this guy guilty? And half the country looks at it and goes, it's all fake. It's all fake news. He's not guilty at all. He's the best president we ever had. And I don't, I, I genuinely don't know what they're looking at. I, I am fascinated to know what they're looking at because I don't get it at all. I literally don't get it. And some family members are in that camp and we just don't discuss it because it's so ingrained. It's such a divisive topic. Neither side is ever going to give an inch. And I, I would just like somebody for a second to be able to show me in their head what they're thinking. I'd like that too. You wrote a lot about American politics and about the Black Lives Matter movement stemming from the murder of George Floyd by a white police officer. What kind of feedback did you get from your readers? I, what I, I tried to be thoughtful. I tried to be, I tried not to lecture because I don't know enough to lecture. I tried to make it an exploration of what I thought the issues were, and sometimes offers potential solutions, but I tried not to dictate. And I think that what I was going through, a lot of other people were going through as well, in terms of trying to figure out what our place was, what our responsibilities were, what we should be doing. And I still don't know the answer to those questions, but in answer to your question, the feedback was, almost completely positive because I think that I was trying, I was putting into words what a lot of people were grappling with inside, in their heads. Well, you wrote that when you discovered that a lot of people started reading your posts, it was both gratifying and alarming. What was alarming about it? Well, it, it, I, I understand why, you know, I, I have authors that I love and they write a spectacular book, and then the next one is terrible. And th th there's that same thing happens with friends of mine who are playwrights. Everyone has a success, and then you have to follow it up. And will they like it? Will they not like it? And writing every day the way that I did, I went through all of that, but very quickly, so that I would write a post where I would think, oh, this is awful. No one's going to like this. And then everybody would really like it. And then the next day I would say, oh, how am I gonna write one that everyone really likes? I'm gonna to have to do it like that one. And right away I realized that I just had to accept the fact that the next one had to be whatever the next one was and people would either like it or not like it. And because I was getting so much feedback every single day, I stopped worrying whether people liked one or liked the other. I, I kept an eye on whether on what the response to them was, but it stopped being meaningful to me in terms of judging the work. I, I, I was like, oh, they liked that. Oh, they didn't like that one. Too bad. Oh, well, on to the next. And I still, and I know that a lot of people don't comment or don't like or dislike. They will read it and ignore it or read it and go, oh, that was good. And then don't think about it again. So in a lot of ways, the way that I wrote every day was a godsend because I 
just stop worrying about it. Uh, you know, what, whatever people's response was, it was their response and God bless. Well, you obviously did a lot of research in writing your columns. You wrote about everything from the plague and the Spanish flu to Shakespeare, Typhoid Mary, Christopher Columbus, Amos and Andy, the Brothers Grimm, the history of Memorial Day, the Mason-Dixon line, the U.S. Supreme Court, and so much more. How many hours a day did you work on writing these columns? Well, my usual schedule was that I'd wake up in the morning, whenever I woke up, I would stumble into the kitchen and unload the dishwasher, feed the cat, and make some coffee. And then once every, the cat was settled and the coffee was brewed, I'd sit down and I would write usually from about 10 to 1, 10 to 1.30, something like that, and then publish. And, I, and then for the rest of the day, I would walk um, throughout the streets of New York. And then we would, do, we would watch TV in the evening and have dinner together or Zoom with friends or something like that. So that was my schedule almost every day. And I rarely knew what I was going to write about until I sat down and wrote about it. Sometimes before I went to sleep the night before, I'd get the first sentence and go, oh, well, that'd be interesting to think about. So that as I was writing, uh, something would, uh, and I was like, what happened with Typhoid Mary? And then I would start researching Typhoid Mary and I would go down a complete rabbit hole because the things that I'd vaguely heard about or knew something about, it turns out I didn't know anything about it at all. And I would just become fascinated with it and kind of take everybody with me, depending on what it was that I was digging into. During the lockdown, when we couldn't go anywhere, the vast majority of people spent their time binge watching TV and movies and reading books. So in a way, the arts became more important to society than ever before. Now, as you know, governments are always threatening to cut funding to the arts. Do you think the pandemic taught lawmakers anything about the importance of the arts to a healthy society? No, I, I, I don't think they, I, I don't think lawmakers are capable of learning. I, I, I think we, we learned so much that the thing that I, I hold on to from all of that is the fact that pre-pandemic, the arts in New York brought in more, or the arts in our country brought in more revenue than all sports teams in every kind of sport combined. And that was an eye opener. And I think everybody realized that over the course of the pandemic, and I don't think it's changed a blessed thing. I think that when people hear of the National Endowment of the Arts, they, the people who are against it immediately think of things that they find offensive. Maybe the photographs of Robert Maplethorpe or the, artist who, uh, who maybe comments on a religion somehow. And they, and it's all fear-based. It's all people who are unwilling to let a, a different idea in or are not really capable of seeing that commenting on something doesn't necessarily mean that the artist hates the thing they're commenting on. They're just frustrated with it maybe or trying to understand it. And I think the arts will always be important to the people who arts are important to, but you can show financial statistics of the people who don't like the arts to your blue in the face. And I, it's just not gonna change anything. I understand the importance of, of sports. I, I understand its revenue. I understand, I mean, the Romans figured it out. It kept the population in line, you know, bread and circuses and all that. So for millennia, governments have understood how important it was to fund sports. I just don't believe that we're ever really gonna to get to a place where we hold the arts in the same esteem, sadly. Well, one of the most refreshing things about your book is that you emphasize the importance of the arts to the economy. The fact is that theaters pump billions of dollars into the economy and New York City simply could not survive without the arts. Isn't that right? It's absolutely true. Well, Toronto is the same way. You know, in, in any sort of small town America, if you drive through America now, many, many small towns have recently, like in the last 
15, 20 years, refurbished theaters in their town because someone has shown them that if you start presenting plays and musicals and concerts and lectures, people are going to come to that theater and those people are going to need to park. Those people are gonna to need to eat. In some cases, those people are gonna to need to stay in a hotel room. They are going to need to go and buy some aspirin because they've gotten a headache and they want to not have a headache before they watch whatever there is they're going to watch. Or they watch something and it gave them a headache and they need to buy an aspirin. So the, the uh, we did Phantom of the Opera. Uh, I was on tour with them in 94 and 95. And I remember reading something that we spent eight weeks in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, beyond the ticket sales of Phantom of the Opera in Rhode Island, in those eight weeks, the town, the city, calculated that we had brought $50 million worth of income in, in all those other ancillary areas while we were there. That's why the arts are important, or, or why the arts should be important up and beyond their intrinsic artistic value. Well, I found it very validating that you stressed in your book that the federal and New York state governments did not do enough to help the theater community during the pandemic, given the value of theater to the economy. They didn't at all. And I will go so far as to say that I don't believe the theatrical union of, for actors and stage managers in New York did enough either. I think that the, a lot of people dropped the ball on that. There, was, there were a lot, uh, I have a lot of friends who run small theaters who were trying to figure out how to keep afloat during this time. And some of that involved showing taped versions of plays, which ordinarily fall underneath SAG and AFTRA, the film and television union. And there was a, it, it took years, I, I mean, like uh, well over a year before any kind of meaningful agreement between the two unions came about. And largely, I think, because the theater union was asking for everything and not willing to give it anything. And a lot of small theaters, the cost of showing these streaming things, of paying everybody involved thousands of dollars, when your entire budget is maybe $100,000, was just impossible to sustain. And I don't think, I think we're still getting the tail end of that. I, I think that it's created a, a rift between the unions that I think is just nonsensical. And I think eventually the unions need to just unite so that all the actors are under one umbrella, whether you're acting on stage or acting in a film or on television. Because I think we've, as divisive as we've gotten in politics is as divisive as we've gotten in arts administration. It's just, it, the models don't work anymore. Richard, I was very touched by something you wrote in October, 2020, after coming out of quarantine, following your trip to Florida to visit your mother. You said, I'm quoting you here, I am so lucky to live under the umbrella of some of the most important freedoms. I can love and marry whomever I choose, whether they are of my same sex or another. The women in my life can choose what happens to their bodies without a man telling them that they can't. I can speak my mind freely without governmental interference, and I can vote. Well, Richard, given the recent ruling of the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade, how do you feel now about living in America? Every single one of those freedoms is under fire and, and badly under fire and seriously under fire. And I, what I worry about is that the younger half of our population has no earthly idea what it's like to live without those freedoms. They're coming into adulthood, being able to marry wh whom they choose. The people of color are being so disenfranchised when it comes to voting that, and, and, and it's been a steady erosion over decades. And uh, I mean, literally since the Civil War, frankly. So all of our rights are so fragile and so hard fought for 
And I just, I, I am worried. I, I, I don't see a clear path forward. I, I think we've got a long fight to hold on to those freedoms ahead of us. I, you, know, you know you're always welcome here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, and that said, I know we'll win. I, I, I think what's happened, we always do. The right always beats wrong. It always does. It takes a while sometimes. And I thought we were on our way up. And now we seem to have dropped back down again. But, you know, we just have to keep going back up again. You wrote that the events that happened during the pandemic made you lose your political innocence. Why do you feel that way? I think that spending so much time looking at what was going on and trying to figure out motives and realizing how many of our elected officials are in somebody else's pocket and doing somebody else's bidding and what the reality is of, you know, we, we just heard this morning, a couple of days ago, Manchin, the guy from West Virginia, signaled that he was okay with going forward with uh, energy bill that addresses climate change. They made some big deal modifications. Well, just today, another uh, senator or congressperson has gotten in the way and is now saying, well, I don't think so. And it's all a egotistical power play. The way that our government is set up, a single individual like that can gum up the entire works. And we just, we went to Hyde Park uh, this past week and we're, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor lived. And they have a spectacular museum up there. And when he got elected at the beginning of the depression, he had an overwhelming majority in both houses. And he was able to do everything that he needed to do to move the country forward. And there were people who hated him for it, truly hated him for it. But Herbert Hoover was doing nothing to get us out of the depression. And of all of what Franklin Delano Roosevelt, most of what Franklin Delano Roosevelt was doing really started making a difference in moving us in the right direction. World War II then ended the depression because war is of course good for the economy. But I can look at all of that now in a way that I don't think I could have three years ago. I, I, I understand I'm highly suspicious all the time now in a way that I really wasn't before. I'm like, okay, what do they want? Why are they doing that? And if you think about it for a few seconds, you can usually figure it out. You know, what's really fascinating to me about your book is that unlike other books about the pandemic that were written after the events, your columns were written in the moment without any idea of what was to come. So Richard, looking back with 2020 vision, is there anything you regret saying in your blog? No, because I said it in the time. Uh, I, there are things that I came to not believe were true. And I, I mean, I was a huge supporter of Andrew Cuomo and had no idea what he was doing that wasn't good. And when it came time to edit down the book, I took some of that pro Cuomo stuff out because I, I, there were days where I would go on about him on, on end. But, uh, but even a year later, it was like, that doesn't, that's not gonna ring true now. And even though it's how I felt then, if I put that in now, the book is gonna be discounted because I was clearly in the wrong frame of mind. So there's enough in there that shows that I, what I thought, but not so much that it looks like I was you know, solidly behind Andrew Cuomo the 100% of the time. So I, I look back at that now, and I'm also, I love the fact that about three posts in, I say, oh, it looks like we're going to be cut down, locked down for about another two weeks. I don't know what all of us are going to do for two weeks, but we'll figure it out. And uh, my sister just started rereading it. And my sister actually is responsible for the painting on the cover. And, which is one of the pictures I took down in Chinatown during the pandemic that she then painted. So my sister te texted me the other day and she said, I just got up to January 4th and you're so hopeful and 
I, I'm just not going to read any further for a while. I just want to stay in January 4th. Uh, I'll, I'll read about the 5th and 6th later. <laughs> Well, there is an optimism in the book, and I especially appreciated your comments about what was positive in your life that came out of the pandemic. You said that you were crazy busy before the pandemic. You were like living on a hamster wheel, but somehow the pandemic rewired you and made you not want to be working at such a hectic pace all the time. Do you think you can find a way to sustain a healthy balance between work and home life? It's what I'm trying to figure out now. I, I like the way we live during the pandemic. And I am trying, I, I'm, we, we actually have a meeting with a friend of ours who's a financial consultant, because I want to know just how little I need to work um, before I retire. And I know I'm going to be fine once I retire and pensions and stuff kick in, as long as, you know, something doesn't happen to the pension funds or whatever. But it's, it's now like how do, how do I work the least amount and get by until I can do that? And also, how do I avoid doing things I don't want to do? Uh, I have a whole bunch of Mandy Patinkin and Patti LuPone concerts coming up, and I love doing those. They're totally fun. And they're, you know, ordinarily, it's you fly out the day before, you work hard that day, and you all go out to have dinner, and then the next day you fly home. So th that kind of thing is kind of great. Michael and I both just worked on a new musical version of The Karate Kid, which we've been working on since before the pandemic. We did a reading, and then last June, we did a workshop here in New York. And then this past April, May, June, we were out in St. Louis, at Stages in St. Louis, doing a production. And it's the first, that production, I was only there for about 11 or 12 weeks, but it was work. And I didn't have time to walk. I didn't have time to write, really. And I was, and I was like, hmm, I don't know if I like this. I, I had a great time. It was a, it, it's a wonderful show. It, it, you kind of think Karate Kid the musical, really? Is that a good idea? And it actually turns out it is. It's, it's a very sweet show, got great reviews. We had a wonderful cast. But the COVID thing also added a whole dimension of difficulty to it. And it's just a lot of work. And it'll probably come into New York in the spring. And I'm already thinking, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm going to do it. But do I want to do it? So we'll see. <laughs> well, I want to see it. Absolutely. It was, it was wonderful. A wonderful production. Directed by a Japanese director named Amon Miyamoto, whose only work in North America really has, he's done some opera and he did a big revival of Pacific Overtures that was on Broadway in 2012 that got him a lot of attention. But he's a big deal in Japan, but really not that well known here. There was something you said in the book about one of the benefits of the pandemic for you. You said that you found clarity by being still. What does that mean? Because there's not the noise of running through airports and working 24 hours a day, I sat on the couch where I am right now and I thought about things. And when I went walking, walking for me is like meditation. And I let all the thoughts that are in my head percolate around and then they kind of sift out. And the things that I were, was obsessing about just don't hold up when you have nothing else to think about that you kind of go, oh, okay, well, I guess I don't need to do that anymore. And then it, it, it just became easier to deal with things. In some ways, work is a little bit harder because to, I have to sort of generate myself. It's like going back to the gym after not working out for a long time. It takes a long time to get back up to where you were. And I don't wanna get back to where I was because I don't wanna lose the clarity of thinking that I feel like I've gained from just being still. I don't think you will lose it because you're very focused, you're articulate, and you have a vision for how you want to live your life. And I know you've mentioned that you are writing a book now about your dad. I also want to plant an idea in your head. I think you should write a memoir. I mean, you've had such an amazing life. Besides your really exciting career and the fabulous stars you've worked with, look at the adventures you've had. You went to Hugh Hefner's 75th birthday party at the Playboy Mansion. 
You had dinner at Orso's with Elaine Stritch, who was gossiping about Lauren Bacall and Stephanie Powers, who then both showed up. You must have a million amazing stories you could tell. Well, interestingly, both that book and the book that I'm writing about my father are really end up in the, at the end of the day being memoirs. So I, I feel like that in some ways writing about myself after these would be redundant. And my, my father had written, a me- when he retired, my, he didn't know what to do and he was a writer. And my sister said, you need to write a memoir. You need to write down all the family stories that you told us that we can't remember. So write them all down. And that's what he did. So I have a 350 page memoir from my father that is just not very interesting because my father didn't write anything personal in it. There's, there's some personal stuff, but he'll write about the house that he lived in when he was six and everything he can remember about the house, but he doesn't necessarily write about what he felt or what he did. And so I'm trying to piece that together and in doing so, figure out my own life. So in some ways, even though I'm, I was writing about the pandemic or I was writing about my father, I'm writing about myself. I'm writing about how did I navigate through the pandemic? And I think, I mean, people get to know me in the book, which is I think why it works. And I think it's why my father's memoir doesn't work because you don't get to know him. You get to know him in terms of what he's interested in, but who the guy was is what I'm trying to suss out. I think you did it beautifully in Hold Please. I certainly felt like I made a new friend when I was reading this book, and I couldn't wait to talk to you. I really enjoyed reading it. It's been such a pleasure to have you on our show. I hope you'll come back when you get the next book out. Absolutely. In a heartbeat. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, Richard. You are an absolute delight. Thank you, Harvey. Likewise. It's uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Our guest has been Richard Hester, author of Hold Please, Stage Managing a Pandemic, which is now available wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.